Thank you. I think this question is probably for Shane, and maybe the, it's kind of a three part, the third part is probably for Sonia. Uh, I talked to a geologist about two weeks ago, and he said the stuff they pump back down, the fluid, is about 99% water. And the way I think I do math is that's about 10,000 parts per million. And then, the, but I, in fairness to him, it then migrates to a well and probably gets diluted some more. So uh, my question, first part is what concentration is typically found in a well? Second part of the question is can I get a bottle of that so I can ask him to drink it? <laughs> and the third part, which is probably more for Sonia and other groups, is can we, even next time there's a contaminated well, bottle a bunch of it, label it, and present a number of bottles to each of our Colorado legislators? <laughs> Yeah, Wes has got something here. I just think that when you take serious toxic chemicals, it only takes a single drop to contaminate an entire Olympic-sized swimming pool to a lethal dose. As you know, in Colorado, the industry's not yet reported. Now, they've just passed a rule where they will have to report their chemical concentration of the frac fluids starting in April. Uh, and it's generally correct that 99% of what goes down is sand and water and cargo. Uh, but as Jane says, I mean, we could say the same thing about sewage, you know. Sewage is 99% water. It's the contaminants that we're concerned about. And uh, about a, a one-tenth of one percent is particularly hazardous. But when we're dealing with one frack job causing, you know, using five million gallons, just a half of one percent of that would be 10,000 gallons of hazardous materials. So it, it, the, it's significant in how much they have to bring to the, to the site. Now, what else we don't know, soon we'll know what goes down. But they don't require it to be reported when they're not fracking. And the industry does a lot of well makeovers with heavy chemicals unrelated to fracking. That's not getting reported. And then what comes back, they don't report. And some more bad things might come back, particularly metals, radionuclides. The state's been admonished to get this information, but in, over 15 years ago. They were admonished by a group called Stronger to get that information on radio and nuclides, and that doesn't happen. So the industry, on top of that, will be able to claim proprietary and keep secret its unique chemical use. So it's really quite hidden from us, as you can see. I like your idea, you know, can they drink it? Halliburton officials um, have created just after EPA uh, subpoenaed them last November, Halliburton said they have a benign, you know, uh, food grade fracking recipe. And some of their uh, representatives have gone around the nation and drinking th these other uh, benign fracking chemicals. And we should say to them, as you're saying, if you can drink it, you can use it. Um, and would be a, I challenge a community here to do that to see if, if they would have the legal authority to do that. So, certainly the industry has created benign fracking chemicals, and it would be a good test for Aurora or a Commerce City or Broiler to demand they be used. That is the problem of subjecting such a community home rule improvement to this overriding preemption by the state legislature which says you can. And then ultimately, the, the fear that the industry itself has the ability under the U.S. Constitution to override such rules that, based on many aspects of takings. From them. I, I'm a one-trick pony. I, um, you know, for the water for one well, five million uh, gallons, it would take uh, four thousand truck trips, two thousand in, two thousand out. So in Erie, if you had Eight wells on one pad, just multiply 4,000. You know, you're starting to get very big, big, big numbers of trucks, these huge water trucks coming in and out next to a schoolhouse. But further, further, why are they using our water? We've never agreed to that. The water of the strait belongs to the people. It says so in the Constitution, black letter law. Water of streams is public property. They have never asked us if it's all right with us if they took our water and destroyed it. And the legislature has to be brought up brought up on this subject because they have not looked at it. Uh, I will tell you that I'm a co-sponsor of a, an initiative, uh, Initiative 45, uh, written by a friend of mine, Richard Hamilton, that would make it impossible 
for the oil and gas industry to destroy our water supply. Uh, right now it's caught up in the Supreme Court because the water buffaloes oppose it. They, don't, they like stasis and uh, I work for an organization that calls itself Be the Change. But if this, if this initiative were passed, and there's actually two of them, uh, it would make it pretty hard for the oil and gas industry to take our water supply. I just leave that with you and uh, I would hope for your support. It's a big, big deal, despite what Fred Brown in the Denver Post says, to get an initiative passed in this state. Real quick, and I'll turn it over to Sonia. Um, one of the things that Wes touched on would be to challenge a community to actually try to get that change to sort of amend how COGCC operates. There's a rule under the COGCC, it's rule 529, and to, to try to amend how the oil and gas operates would be to ask them to use green flag, frac fluids. That is something you can do. Um, the COGCC will accept your, uh, sort of your commentary for change. They will post it, they'll publish it, then they'll actually have a hearing on it. So it's worth a shot. The more we do, the more we can become aware that they need to make these changes. Um, in the handout that I circulated, um, there's information on different websites. So there's uh, Fracking Colorado, uh, Save Colorado from Fracking, Be the Change, uh, etc. And if you go to those, you'll see what's going on all over Colorado in local communities and certainly get involved in your local area uh, to do just what um, Shane is suggesting. So for example, in Aurora, we've been petitioning the uh, city of Aurora to enact a six month moratorium. And we've been asking for that because the longer they're not fracking, the worse the news is that's coming out that they can then go, oh, there is a problem here and start to orient to um, solving it with uh, appropriate rules. Questions? Yes, there's something real quick here. It's good, right here, please. Oh, yeah. uh, right. Yeah. Has someone taken a close look at the so-called inert or green uh, fracking chemicals? I, I handled uh, chemical injury cases for years as a, uh, as a lawyer, and uh, companies would represent a chemical as being harmless. This is an inert ingredient. And further research showed that it was very toxic. I had a client uh, severely injured by one of those. Good question. Good question. I know I haven't. That's a great, you know, anything in, in excessive amounts to include pure water can be lethal, but I think it's a great thing that we should discover. Well, a big problem with the green fracking fluids, even if they were green, they're still bringing up uh, radionuclides and heavy metals along with it. So you still have some different kind of toxic problem. One would expect to reduce the amount of hazardous air pollutants associated with some of these green fracking fluids. But we're just dependent on the industry doing that in its own self-interest right now. I, I, I disagree with Shane a little bit. If we, would, we as a community would go to the Oil and Gas Commission and ask for green flagging fluids, I think we'd be dead on arrival. You know, this is a governor who said he wants no additional legislation this year on this industry. Uh, the Oil and Gas Commission went through rulemaking some three years ago. And they're, they're settled. You know, we just had this one minor change about disclosure of the chemicals going down, but um, I, I think we're not likely to see any real changes by this industry given the bipartisan support. If, if there's going to be change, we're going to have to, we're going to have to implement change ourselves. It's not going to come from officialdom. Um, you know, it's interesting. New York State, I think, is coming very, very close to just outlawing fracking altogether. Uh, it's going to be a hard push. But they've seen what's happened in Pennsylvania, which is right next door. Our disadvantage is we haven't seen it yet in any magnitude. But when we do start seeing it in magnitude, it's going to be devastating uh, to the state. I mean, to the values that most of us hold dear. And I think that's what you have to recognize. This is something you have never seen. Just think about eight or 16 wells on one pad that can be 10 or 15 acres. And it's an industrial activity that goes on and on and on and on. And if they if they have to truck the oil out, they're going to, it's going to be constant truck traffic. It's going to be constant. So try and get your mind about 
what you're facing in terms of real change to the topography and the way people live in these towns. I cannot believe that the government will not allow cities to ban fracking for, the, for their own, I mean, they should have that right. It's a basic civil right that you should be able to say, we don't want this in our town. Question to us, Joe here, Rick. I met with uh, Senator Carroll the other night, Friday night, and she assures me that your phone calls and your emails make a difference. You heard Sonia's bill is coming up on Thursday. That bill is in the local government committee. Please make an effort to call the people in that committee. Senator Carroll has another bill coming up, 12107. It will put restrictions on the oil companies about water. It's not on the calendar yet, 12107. But please call, that's in the Judiciary Committee. Please call the people in that committee and ask them to support this bill. It requires that gas and oil operators submit water quantity reports showing projected and actual sources and amounts of water needed, that they have to post a bond around for land around wells that are, uh, water wells that are being fracked. And if something happens to the well, that money will go to uh, revive those water wells that are ruined. Um, follow the legislation. Your voice does make a difference. It does make a difference. That's great, thanks Rick. Absolutely. Uh, next question, gentlemen. Yeah, what's, what was the basis of the exemption of exemptions for the oil industry from the Clean Water Act? The 2005 Energy Policy Act exemptions. <laughs> what are the basis? <laughs> 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 the secret meetings with the energy industry was the basis of that act. Yes, and one of the things that I ask the oil and gas industry when they're present, I ask them, how have the exemptions helped you operate? Clearly, it's the only way they can operate. Exactly. Certainly, as the gentleman in the back pointed out, it was Dick Cheney lar largely led the initiative to exempt fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act. But let me make this clear. The exemptions that this industry has from the Comprehensive Liability Act, the Clean Air Act, uh, the Emergency uh, Planning and Community Right to Know Act, the Clean Water Act, are bipartisan. Both parties, on a national level, have exempted oil and gas exploration from these federal rules. So, it, yes, that one particular thing was led by Dick Cheney, but um, even Brett, then uh, Senator Obama from Illinois passed, you know, voted for that exemption. So we face bipartisan support in part because it's domestic oil and gas, it's not foreign. Uh, there's that strong interest among both parties to develop oil and gas within the United States. Uh, but I agree with Phil. I, I'm coming around to the point of view that only community activists, only people working in your towns have a real chance of changing it the way Pittsburgh did. Look at what Pittsburgh did and, and think about that total ban. Because if we have our hand out uh, to normal uh, powers that be, they have slapped it down many times and said that, that domestic oil and gas trumps your, your own community rights and your own property rights. Question, lady in the back, yes. I'd just like to elaborate on what Wes said about Pittsburgh and point out that it's a different approach that they took. It doesn't depend on zoning power. It would not be defeated by SB 12008, but it requires great courage from the citizens. The kind of courage that the original founders of our country displayed when they said for the first time that human beings have the right to happiness, it's not about the king. The kind of courage that the people who were involved in um, following Martin Luther King on the great marches, they didn't ask for a regulation to limit the mistreatment of slaves. They said, people have a right to be free. I have some books here about the rights, the human right to clean water and sanitation that have now been recognized at an international level by the United Nations. 
and also going through the United Nations now are the rights of nature. We hope that there will be a worldwide conversation about the rights of nature to exist in their natural state. <laughs> and it's these influences that are the basis for the democracy school and are the basis for the courageous action that the City Council of, of Pittsburgh took and the basis for them to stand on a taproot of law that goes down as deep as the beginning of humanity, which is if I live here on this planet, I should be able to breathe. I should be able to drink water. And that's true of the trees and the coyotes and the other critters too. So that's a really courageous step that steps outside of the regulatory system altogether and goes to original democracy. If you want the books, I've got them to contribute to you. There's a democracy school here in Denver on the 24th and 25th. Yeah. You can find it at Be the Change site. Sign up for it if you want to. I think it's $135. It's a day and a half. Thank you for your powerful statement. I couldn't agree more that corporate identities have, uh, well, they have identities, but the environment doesn't. An identity of a corporation is not a living thing, but the environment is. So we need to fight for that. Yes, Becky. I'm a big fat voice. Uh, so I'm Becky English with Sierra Club here in Colorado. Uh, I work with Shane and some others in the room. I just want to invite anyone who would like to be part of an anti-fracking campaign to come and talk with me after this, and we'll sign you up. We need lots of volunteer activity to make this work. Thank you. Lots of power. Yes, right here. Yes. Sorry. Yes, please. I have two questions. One. Uh, do we, does, this, does this campaign have any allies in the legal industry that could help put together something that would address especially Phil's approach of a more basic constitutional right to not lose our resources to this? Yeah. And secondly, uh, I live in, in uh, Cross Creek and I'm noticing the 42-inch pipeline going through. Is that, is that a precursor to the inevitable start of fracking out there? Does anybody know that? Oh yeah, you guys are. You guys are due. <laughs> you are absolutely due. I, I think there are a number of approaches you can take. I mean, I'm co-sponsoring two, two initiatives. One is three, and one is 45. Three would make water a public trust, like many Western states, uh, and would give public access to the high water marks on all navigable rivers. 45 would make it unlawful. We would, we would be changing Article 16, 5, and 6 of the state constitution. And changing our, uh, Section 6 of the constitution under beneficial use, we would simply say that to destroy or make water unusable is unlawful, is not considered a beneficial use, so it would be unlawful in fact. And uh, this is an uphill struggle, but we do have some legal people involved. Uh, Libby is the lawyer, the administrative lawyer, and there's some other lawyers who are becoming involved. Right now, it's, we haven't advertised this much because it's hung up in court because of the water bubbles. But I think it will get out of there, and I think it will pass the single subject requirement under state law. And if we get enough signatures, 100,000 signatures, we can get it on the ballot. And you can show your public will by saying, we don't want you to destroy our water supply. Also, it's important to note, I'll read out just a real short sentence from the Colorado Constitution, Section 3. We're fortunate in Colorado to have this section. It's called Inalienable Rights. All persons have certain natural, essential, and inalienable rights, among which may be reckoned the right of enjoying and defending their lives and liberties, of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and of seeking and obtaining their safety and happiness. So um, let's take that cue to, um, to advance that in every way we can. Um, I, got a <laughs> I got a bumper sticker to say, it says, after one look at this planet, any visitor from outer space would say, I want to see the manager. You know, <laughs> we, we should have, we were all, I think, wanting to see the manager when the banks uh, pulled all those fast ones with the security swindles and so on that have left us holding the bag. But this is so much bigger. It's not just money. It's water forever destroyed. 
It's our future. It's our ability to have security. It's our children's health. It's our ability to manage um, a, a livable life for the future for all of us. Our approach and your approach should be health over wealth, not wealth over health. Yes, there's a question here. So I'm curious, I uh, work with the Earth Guardians in Boulder and we're putting together a fracking presentation for the kids to go out to the schools to present and one question that I keep coming up against, okay, so instead of going out there and just saying we're opposed, we're opposed, we're opposed, what alternatives are there to developing the natural gas that we could all go heat our homes with? How would we shift to a real natural energy economy? How would we heat our homes that are already existing without fracking, without natural gas? We don't need fossil fuels, we need healthy energy. <laughs> Name an energy source out there that's healthy, and that's the one we need. Uh, I guess I'm somewhat of a quizzling on this, but um, I think the city should have the right to ban, and I think they should have the right to ban out to the boundaries of their area of influence. I think it's, I think it's categorically their right. But I think in some of these rural areas, uh, I think it can maybe be done, but it shouldn't be done with water. And um, if they can find alternative methods, and they're, they're available, uh, how successful they are, I don't know. But I'm in this to win. And uh, I'm sorry, but I, th I think you're probably going to have to allow some fracking at the outset. I think when people discover how bad it truly is, it may cease. But I don't know that we can win this as a statewide ban at this point. If we had more information in surrounding states, maybe, like New York. But they started out, they're way ahead of us anyway. I mean, they had bans on all these water, you know, the sources of their water supply. We don't even ban South Park, for God's sakes. I mean, that's how ridiculous this is. But New York started out way ahead of us, and they've seen what's happened in Pennsylvania, which is disastrous. So I don't, you know, I don't generally advocate incrementalism, but in this case, I think if we can stop bans in the cities and their, and their areas of influence, we've, we've turned the engine around. And that, then I think we can say, you can only do it in these places and these are the restrictions. And we can make them pretty tight. No venting, you know, no water, blah, blah, blah. Let me try to take a crack at that. What are other choices do we have? <laughs> Let me make it clear what we know. We know that fossil fuels will harm the planet. It's unequivocal. Either we stop fossil fuel burning or it may stop our society. So the question is, what's the least cost way to get our energy? And, it'll, and the very first focus will be energy efficiency. So we, we must stop subsidies to the oil and gas industry. This is a state that's doing uh, subsidies to natural gas uh, vehicles. So we're, we're subsidizing our own demise. Um, so clearly, once we understand, it's unequivocal that burning fossil fuels harms the planet. The science is clearly in. Now we know natural gas development is even worse than coal with respect to that, that particular equation. Um, so we must find a way to get base load, electrical power, um, either wind is now coming in as nearly equal to the cost. Of course, all the fossil fuel industry as a free dump. It's called our life. They're dumping into our atmosphere. Um, so unless we change that, we should actually be taxing carbon emission. Um, that we won't get to a fundamental change in our society. But it's clear we must. Sea level rise, methane increasing. And let me make one more point about this natural gas industry. They've overdeveloped here in the United States so that the price of natural gas is gone down by a factor of four. The next thing we'll see by this industry is to sell our natural gas overseas. They're only after the money. They're not after protecting our national interests. I thought that was already happening. Uh, it's, no, it's very little natural gas. There's no natural gas exported from the United States in, to any effect. Uh, you have to compress it and put it into a ship as liquefied natural gas. But a number of ports that were approved in the 90s for importing natural gas of course didn't happen because we developed this fracking technology, have now been reversed and they've been approved by the federal government 
to export the natural gas. So we must turn this ship around. Fossil fuels will take us down. We will find a way. That's the silver lining. We understand that. And so getting to any renewable resource won't have the air pollution, won't have the climate change. We can do this. Question here. Yeah, I just want to say that there were two bills up uh, last week in the uh, House Local Control Committee. And uh, one was uh, from Aurora Sue Ryden, Representative Sue Ryden, on a, a thousand foot setback for uh, drilling near uh, homes and schools. And that went down. And the other was from Roger Wilson out in uh, western Colorado related to uh, water, and that went down. And they went down without, it was a partisan vote, but I will tell you, David Balmer from Aurora pounded, pounded Sue Ryden on the jobs issue. Pounded her. Why are you running jobs out of this state? We are going to uh, lose jobs because of this bill. The word's going to get out that Colorado is against fracking because of this her bill, which is the most mild bill. So if you want something to happen, you have got to get on the stick and get with your legislators, and you really have to let those guys know that you care because that's what they pay attention to. The, granted, the Colorado Petroleum Institute and uh, Colorado Association of Commerce and Industry have a lot of pull, but they don't have the votes. So you have to get out there and let these guys know in big numbers that their jobs are going to be lost because that's what they pay attention to. I'd rather have clean water and clean air. Let me just say that's my wife and she runs Colorado Capital Watch. She spends all <laughs> A comment and a question. The comment is that the World Renewable Energy Forum is coming to Colorado, co-sponsored by the American Solar Energy Society and the Colorado Renewable Energy Society, among others. And so far, they've received over 800 papers addressing various renewable technologies. So there is no shortage of alternatives to fossil fuels. A lot of it is ready for prime time now, and an awful lot more is being developed. My question is regarding the uh, well, in Gasland, they showed water that you can set on fire coming out of your faucets. And when you talk to geologists, they say that's natural, particularly in Wyoming. It's just natural occurrence. The, the gas gets, you know, in with the water and it comes up out of the faucets. They say, you know, it's kind of like a background gas of sorts. And so I have two questions regarding that. One is, is that a myth? Is that true at all? And second, even if it is true, is there a possibility that's related to wells or mining done maybe 100 years ago or over the last 100 years? And, and how does that compare, this background, to what happens when you have that level of density of fracking? It is true that in portions of Colorado, there's historic biogenic gas in some of these domestic wells. Uh, biogenic gas, think of it as uh, typically a buried log in a floodplain or just bacteria working on coals that are near the surface. So up here in Well County, we do have historic uh, incidents of biogenic gas showing up in the domestic well. The problem is this. Uh, such conditions can be exacerbated by nearby drilling. So you might have had biogenic gas prior to drilling, and now a lot more is coming, particularly because there can be a pressure gradient pushed out by these heavy frack jobs. The Colorado doesn't investigate that. When this issue came up in Gasland, Professor uh, Tony Ingrafi and I, from, uh, Tony's from uh, Cornell, we put in a pitch to the state to look at these secondary um, mechanisms, such as a pressure wave, but the state did not look at it. So the state has this view, it finds biogenic gas, it means it's not coming from the industry. They don't look at what you're implying about being exaggerated. In fact, we had a real problem in Garfield County where um, an independent investigator from the Colorado School of Mines was finding both the kinds of gas. The biogenic gas that comes from bacteria and the thermogenic gas that comes deep. 
and he made no progress. He is is. Uh, the head of his department would allow him to publish his own thoughts that it was caused by the industry. But it was it was said best by a oil and gas liaison from Garceau County who got fired over this. She says it was hard to believe that the gas was down there for 65 million years and just now came to the surface. <laughs> so they used this uh, <clears throat> some natural conditions to hide behind. This short answer. Question. Um, I just wanted to make one quick announcement about a resource that might be of interest to people. Renewables are completely ready for prime time at this point. Depending on the financing, the cost structure is very clean. And there's um, a national group which has absorbed the Apollo Alliance called the Blue Green Alliance. And it's easy to Google that. Blue Green Alliance, blue for blue collar labor, green for environmentalism. <coughs> And it's focused heavily on the fact that jobs and the environment are not a contradiction. They can be done together. Uh, they've gotten to the point where they're doing major national conferences. They've broken, their, it, there's so many people involved at this point that they're, they've broken from one big national conference last year to four regional conferences this year. I wish it were five with one in this part of the, of the country, but they're in in order of uh, chronology, um, Atlanta this month, uh, Los Angeles next month, uh, Philadelphia, and then Detroit. But dozens of workshops at each, hundreds of speakers. This stuff is for real, and, and any legislator who's willing to sit down and actually have an open mind can be educated on it. Thanks, Ted. Let's thank you for bringing it back here. And just to follow up on that, I wanted to point out that whatever monies we put into infrastructure for developing natural gas could be put into the infrastructure for developing the renewables. And so to the extent that our national ener energy policy is pushing these fossil fuels, we are in fact impeding any, well not any, but we are impeding the development of the renewables. Um, and I wanted to follow up on a couple other things people mentioned, that um, this business of the gas going to China, I'm always hearing but we need it. You heat your home with gas. But we, the fact is there are other ways to extract gas. We have traditional ways of extracting gas. There are other ways of fracking that don't involve water. And um, again, there's conservation, as people said. So, so to the extent that we buy into this argument that natural gas is, is a bridge, just think, it's a bridge to nowhere. And that's what we have to let other people know. As long as we do this, we'll never get to renewables. Um, the other issue having to do with jobs is, you know, the oil and gas industry is going to talk about how many jobs they're providing, and now they're talking about super fracking. Has anybody heard about that? Okay, so that's one of their new technologies, the purpose of which is to reduce the labor costs. So um, you can Google that and find that. I think that was the end of my comments. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next question? Right over here. We've got two over here. Let me cruise around the back here. Okay, I can speak without Okay, great. Okay, uh, thank you all. My name is James, and, and I wanted to uh, uh, have a couple things to ask about. Uh, one is the democracy schools. I went to the CELDAS website, it's uh, environmentallegaldefensefund.org, <coughs> and the videos are up there. There's, there's eight half hour videos that are wonderful. I'm not quite sure of the equivalence of how the schools, but those videos are, are there, are, are ready uh, for your available, availability right now. Uh, the other thing was Chris Hedges. Uh, the, the author, he was noting that, summarizing, to say that the power of the are harvesting our country, uh, you know, whatever wealth, resources, and so forth. So all those profits, that's what, that's what they're going for. Um, and uh, I, I also um, wanted to bring in, to me, it's time to occupy the well. I don't know what you guys think about that. <laughs> Sure, thank you. I think it's because you've got somebody like Josh Fox, who is my age, who can actually connect with that Generation X and Y and Z and whatever generation there are, which is really important because that is their future. Uh, we need everybody's help. This gentleman had a question. 
Thanks. Uh, I'm a registered professional engineer, and you might ask me, why the hell am I here? Well, the answer is, is because I have grandchildren, and I'm worried about them. As an engineer, I, I have a company that serves as a, a resource to renewable energy field. And we have a plan that we've developed that will displace 91% of all petroleum in the United States with one substance. Actually, two substances. One is biodiesel and the other is called butanol. How many people here have heard of butanol? Just a few, okay? Now, let's think about butanol from the standpoint of what it can do. It can displace or replace fossil gasoline. And it can displace diesel fuel as well. It works in both, okay? Well, the problem that we have with the industry is that the industry says, oh, well, you guys, you're all a bunch of nimbies, okay? You're, you're just saying not in my backyard. It could be in someone else's backyard, but not in mine, all right? So we need to come up with effective arguments to say, no, we're trying to save the, the, the damn planet and our health and the health of our grandchildren along with them. That's what we need to do. And, and, and until we can come up with effective arguments that basically say, no, it's not just in our backyard that we're worried about. It, it's the other, uh, the other part of the world that we're concerned about as well. So when, when we talk about the overall national uh, idea is, is that we, have, we basically have two choices if we're going to stick with fossil fuels. One is that we stop all of this madness going on, all right, and the other, or the other is that we continue to import our fossil fuels from other countries, many of which don't like us, many of which are using the money they get from the fossil, fossil fuels to work against us. So the idea here is that if we have a fuel like butanol that can be made from cellulosic materials, the, the material that, that has the, the most op opportunity to actually make a dent in, in our fossil fuel use, then we, we can actually develop jobs here. We can bring all the money, the $450 billion that goes out every single year to foreign countries for foreign oil and, and distillate imports. When, when we can bring that money back into the country and stop doing the military, the things like, like invading Iraq, for their oil, which is exactly why we went there, then we can actually develop our economy and get off of fossil fuels and be able to make our world a better place. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, I just have a, what I think is a peculiar observation, and in some respects it's shocking. One of my sons is a recent graduate as a windsmith from a local vocational college. And something like half of his class has been hired into the fracking fleet field to go clean the insides of the tanks. Not good. Mm -hmm. Teresa. Don't have to take the job. <laughs> oh. Gas masks. I'm going to go and tell him how to <laughs> So I'm, I'm planning on being at the state capitol on Thursday, and I'm wondering if we can actually say to the legislature or the committee that the fracking is, ab is absolutely violating our, our rights. And I don't know if that's something that will even ring true with them at all, if there's a way to actually bring that up to them. Um, you know, because I, I, I think they need to hear maybe a different message, and I'm not really sure you know, I don't have much experience going down to the Capitol and doing this, but I, I want to be there because I think it's important. The other thing I did, I did want to say is, where does Hicken Looper on all this? And the last thing is... It's in a coffee shop in Davos. <laughs> Recall him. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, I voted for him. Um, <laughs> from, from democracy school, we don't have a fracking problem. We have a democracy problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Looper is a former petroleum geologist. Not only that, he has a task force, 
in Colorado to promote natural gas vehicles for the state? Well, one of the, one of the things Wes and I, uh, Commerce City has put together a panel. The, uh, the city council has to look at options and what the impacts of fracking will be on the city of uh, Commerce City. And one of the concepts we're pushing is a constitutional issue of health, safety, and public welfare. And we all have a right to that. And it's, it, you know, it's pretty much established law that we do. So uh, at this point, I would simply, simply keep repeating this mantra that we all have this right to health, safety, and, and welfare. And these guys are not protecting that right. And if, if they force us to do it ourselves, I guess we'll have to do it ourselves. But that's our obligation. They take, they take a vow, you know, to defend the Constitution and our rights, and they're not doing it. I mean, they're taking money from the oil and gas industry, and they're loading up these committees in agriculture and local business, which doesn't allow a reasonable conversation about what's happening in this state, and we have to stop it. So just continue the mantra. These are our civil rights. You can't take them away from us, and they deal with it. health, safety, and the public welfare. They've taken all these away from us. One more question right here. I'm not familiar with testifying in Colorado. Uh, do you have to sign up ahead of time, or can you sign up right when you get there? You can sign up when you get there. Check their website. A lot of times they'll offer it online where you can sign up. Three minutes. Mm -hmm. Three minutes. You get three minutes time speaking. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Question? One more? One more? Two more? I know I have to run. i got to go four columns. Yeah, I just want one suggestion. One of the big problems with... Uh, doing the right thing in an area like this is that the 1% um, have the money and, and the power and uh, the media and so forth. Um, a suggestion that may seem unrelated that may do an awful lot to help us help the 99% regain our uh, power and control and, and democracy uh, is the idea of a, a, a public banking or a state bank. Um, how many have heard of that? Well, that's good. Um, North Dakota has the only state-owned bank in the country. They have 3.4% unemployment. Uh, they've had a budget surplus the last four years, the only state to do so. Uh, it's true they have a fair amount of oil there, but that's also true in uh, states like Alaska and Montana, and they have high rates of unemployment and huge budgetary problems. Where state-owned or government-owned banking has been tried, it actually promotes um, private business, uh, they have more community-owned banks in North Dakota than any other state in the country. And uh, that bank, the state bank, has uh, turned back um, f over $40 million last year to the state of North Dakota, over $300 million over the past 10 years. And so it's an idea that can do an awful lot to uh, help restore balance and give the funds to the kinds of programs that we all stand for. Yeah, I'd like to put in a, a final two plugs. So the one was for the uh, sheet that was handed out, the two-sided one. Please take a look at that and get other people to also call the legislators. Email them, uh, meet with them if you can, go to the legislature if you can. And a final request is in Aurora, our city council is uh, going to be considering the possibility of doing a moratorium. And so far, it's not looking good in terms of the odds. There are three that, uh, that may well vote for a moratorium. We're not sure of the other council members. They're having a meeting on the 25th. Uh, that's next Saturday at 8.30 in the morning. And we intend to have a very large welcoming committee for them with lots of signs. <laughs> we want them to see how many people care about this issue. And so um, if you could join us, that would be wonderful. It's, it's your water too. Uh, Aurora is still talking about selling its water for fracking as well. Um, it's, you know, the wind will blow. <laughs> if they're doing it in Aurora, it's coming to Denver. Um, so if you'd consider coming, we, our website is uh, frackingcolorado, 
at wordpress.com or just wordpress.com. If you go there, you'll see the information about the rally. I, I, we sure could use your help. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do have a printout here of the Niagara Blade of West put together. Um, I, I coach them. Uh, but anyway, if you'd like it, it will be information that you can use when anybody questions you about uh, you know how big the play really is here. It, it has numbers on it. Water, sand, which is part of the mixture, and poison, which is also part of the mixture. Uh, so anybody would like it. I don't, I don't have enough for everybody, but I have enough for anybody who probably would want to. To this lady who said she doesn't know if she can say what she wants to do to the legislative committee, we most certainly can. Um, the 1% does not have all the power. We all have in terms of our votes. The legislators listen most to the people who show up and are verbal. Um, they know that each constituent has a vote. But they know that if you go there and talk to them, you are going to vote. It helps if you write down the points you want to make and speak as objectively as possible um, so that they don't write you off as being irrational. Because if you talk about hard data, such as health impact, um, uh, the naked uh, landscape from the stability of the soil, things like that, they listen. They know that the are going to pretend that you can back up what you're saying. I think it's really important that massively on 808 days that you show up down there and tell Ted Harvey that he's the symbol we all want to be. Because this man, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? The Republicans always, you know, they talk about small government. But when you really get down to it, they want the oil and gas industry to regulate you every moment in life. Is that not the stupidest thing you have ever heard? And this is a bill that would take away all your rights. And this is a guy that's down there and has taken an oath to protect your rights. Who do you out of office? Isn't it the case that China is buying into a lot of American oil companies? Oh, sure. They bought one third of Chesapeake and they bought up a lot of land in Colorado and Carrera. This lady back here. Uh, with respect to uh, the Bill 1288, I asked Brandon Schaffer point blank about that. And um, he said, I, he actually said that that bill would strip the, the municipalities, the munis and the counties of their ability to do planning and zoning. Pretty much. Now, it seems to me that if that's truly one of the side effects of that bill, every one of our munis and, and county <coughs> commissioners or planning and zoning departments should be up in arms, and we should be contacting them and saying, do you realize what the implications of this are? <coughs> and we have been doing that in Aurora and Arapahoe and calling them out and saying, where are you? You need yeah. to go testify. You know about this? Uh, or, or why do we have a city council if you don't plan to represent us and if you don't believe in representing the rights of, so yeah, it's important to call your lo locals too. Let me think just, just one comment. When, when I presented in Longmont the possibility that citizens could use the citizen initiative to do a total ban, <laughs> at the break, I had a one angry city attorney in front of my city. Yeah, and he pushed him up on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pointing this out. That, you know, all these city attorneys are trained in, in you know, honoring contract law and honoring the state preemption. In 1984, I think it was, the city of Greeley attempted to ban drilling. It's known as uh, the Boss Case. And that's what this attorney was particularly angry at me not knowing. I'm just presenting this to know what you're up to. And in the Voss case, uh, it went to the state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court ruled against the city of Greeley and for the state legislature that the state legislature had, had this right to impose its will on state preemption of local oil and gas restrictions on local communities, restrictions on oil and gas. So, that's why the democracy school, I think, is so important for us. It puts us in the catbird seat. It makes it possible for you to consider a citizen initiative in your community or to impose your will on city councilmen to get them to vote for the type of man in Pittsburgh has. 
because you are up against long-standing law in this regard. The industry scares me with its threats of takings, even takings of uh, loss of their future profits. So here's what we have. We've got a aggressive industry backed by both parties, and thinking they're going to make a billion dollars off of each square mile of land here in Colorado, the way they have in Colorado. I don't I have great faith in going to the state legislature to get that 100 years reversed. Personally, I don't. I think it's, if this is going to change in Colorado, it's going to have to be done by citizens pressing their will. Think about it. You're up against forces that have orchestrated this to secure their success. And yes, I think Teresa and others can go down there and assert correctly that communities have the constitutional right to do this land use and ban if they choose. I think that's accurate. But you're up against all, <coughs> both parties and the legal community as well. You're going to have to assert a right that hasn't been asserted for many decades. In order to prevail. We need to show up in large numbers so that we can have the fight on Yes, you certainly need to do all those things. Uh, but I, I, for one, have kind of given up on trying to make small changes in the regulatory process. Because we have three options. You do nothing in these communities and you get cracked. If you do something and try to make it cleaner, you get cracked. There's only one path to make sure this industry doesn't come into your community. And that's to do the Pittsburgh-style ban. At least that's yeah. Yeah. So we could say the same thing about sewage, you know. Sewage is 99% water. It's the contaminants that we're concerned about. And uh, about a, a one-tenth of one percent is particularly hazardous. But what we're dealing with is one frack job causing, you know, using five million gallons. Just a half of one percent of that would be 10,000 gallons of hazardous food. So it, 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 the, it's significant in how much they have to bring to the, to the site. Now, what else we don't know? Soon we'll know what goes down. But they don't require it to be reported when they're not fracking. And the industry does a lot of well makeovers with heavy chemicals unrelated to fracking. That's not getting reported. And then what comes back, they don't report. And some more bad things might come back, particularly metals, radionuclides. The state's been admonished to get this information, but in, over 15 years ago, they were admonished by a group called Stronger to get that information on radio and and that doesn't happen. So the industry, on top of that, will be able to claim proprietary and keep secret its unique chemical use. So it's really quite hidden from us, as you can see. I like your idea, you know, can they drink it? Halliburton officials, um, have created just after EPA uh, subpoenaed them last November. Thank you. I think this question is probably for Shane, and maybe the, it's kind of a three part, and the third part is probably for Sonia. Uh, I talked to a geologist about two weeks ago, and he said the stuff they pump back down, the fluid, is about 99% water. And the way I think I do math is that's about 10,000 parts per million. And then the but in fairness to him, it then migrates to a well and probably gets diluted some more. So uh, my question, first part, is what concentration is typically found in a well? Second part of the question is, can I get a bottle of that so I can ask him to drink it? <laughs> and the third part, which is probably more for Sonia and other groups, is can we, even next time there's a contaminated well, bottle a bunch of it, label it, and present a number of bottles to each of our Colorado legislators? <laughs> Yeah, Wes has got something here. I just think that when you take serious toxic chemicals, it only takes a single drop to contaminate an entire Olympic-sized swimming pool to a lethal dose. As you know, in Colorado, the industry's not yet reported. Now, they've just passed a rule where they will have to report their chemical concentration of the frac fluids starting in April. Uh, and it's generally correct that 99% of what goes down is sand and water. Uh, but as Jane says, 29. 
and to, to try to amend how the oil and gas operates would be to ask them to use green flag, frac fluids. That is something you can do. Um, the COGCC will accept your, uh, sort of your commentary for change. They will post it, they'll publish it, then they'll actually have a hearing on it. So it's worth a shot. The more we do, the more we can become aware that they need to make these changes. In the handout that I circulated, um, there's information on different websites. So there's uh, Fracking Colorado, uh, Save Colorado from Fracking, Be the Change, uh, etc. And if you go to those, you'll see what's going on all over Colorado in local communities and you certainly get involved in your local area uh, to do just what um, Shane is suggesting. So for example, in Aurora, We've been petitioning the uh, city of Aurora to enact a six-month moratorium. And we've been asking for that because the longer they're not fracking, the worse the news is that's coming out, that they can then go, oh, there is a problem here, and start to orient to um, solving it with uh, appropriate rules. Questions? Yes, there's a real quick here. Okay, right here, please. Oh, right. You're starting to get very big, big, big numbers of trucks, these huge water trucks coming in and out next to a schoolhouse. But further, further, why are they using our water? We've never agreed to that. The water of the strait belongs to the people. It says so in the Constitution and black letter law. Water of streams is public property. They have never asked us if it's all right with us if they took our water and destroyed it. And the legislature has to be brought up, brought up on this subject because they have not looked at it. Uh, I will tell you that I'm a co-sponsor of a, an initiative, uh, Initiative 45, uh, written by a friend of mine, Richard Hamilton, that would make it impossible for the oil and gas industry to destroy our water supply. Uh, right now it's caught up in the Supreme Court because the water buffaloes oppose it. They, don't, they like stasis, and uh, I work for an organization that calls itself Be the Change. But if this, if this initiative were passed, and there's actually two of them, uh, it would make it pretty hard for the oil and gas industry to take our water supply. I just leave that with you, and uh, I would hope for your support. It's a big, big deal, despite what Fred Brown in the Denver Post says, to get an initiative passed in this state. Real quick, and I'll turn it over to Sonia. Um, one of the things that Wes touched on would be to challenge a community to actually try to get that change to sort of amend how COGCC operates. There's a rule under the COGCC, it's rule five. Halliburton says they have a benign, you know, uh, food grade fracking recipe. And some of their uh, representatives are going around the nation and drinking th these other uh, benign fracking chemicals. And we should say to them, as you're saying, if you can drink it, you can use it. Um, and would be a, I challenge a community here to do that to see if, if they would have the legal authority to do that. C certainly the industry has created benign fracking chemicals, and it would be a good test for Aurora or a Commerce City or Brawler to demand they be used. That is the problem of subjecting such a community home rule improvement to this overriding preemption by the state legislature which says you can. And then ultimately, the, the fear that the industry itself has the ability under the U.S. Constitution to override such rules based on many aspects of takings. I, I'm a one-trick pony. I, um, you know, for the water for one well at five million uh, gallons, it would take uh, four thousand truck trips, two thousand in, two thousand out. So in Erie, if you had Eight wells on one pad, just multiply 4,000 by you know, 